Hello, everybody. I see that people are still coming. Uh, nice to see all of you. Uh, before we will start, uh, please, uh, if you are uh, one of the conference speaker like uh, Crane, Kent, Sean, Nia, please, John, also please ask for a, uh, for a right to speak uh, if you are using your phone, and we will give you give it to you immediately. Let's go. What's up, everybody? Hello. Hello. Hello, hello. Nice to see all of you. How is my mic here? I only have one earbud in. You sound yeah, great. Sounds pretty good. Sounds pretty good, yeah. Awesome. Great. Thanks. I think we can slowly start, actually. It's already a All right. few minutes past. Uh, let me introduce our uh, speakers, um, here, here, which are here with me. It's Kent, uh, which, uh, who will be also the moderator of the discussion today. Crane, uh, John, Sean, and uh, Nia. Uh, it's, very, it's very nice to have you here today. Uh, today's this, uh, Twitter space is about testing unit, testing library React, and end-to-end -end integration. So, uh, my dears, the stage is yours. All right. Hey, thanks, everybody. Uh, this is going to be a good time. So, I think it'd probably be a, a good place to start by having people just briefly introduce themselves. I think... Uh, we've got a, about an hour. I, I have a hard stop at the top of the hour, so I, I think that's about as much time as at least I can do. Um, but uh, that should give us enough time for everybody to do a quick intro to themselves. So I'll start. Um, I My name is Kent C. Dodds. I work on epicweb.dev to teach people how to build fantastic full stack web apps. And um, I am the creator of Testing Library, uh, which uh, over the years has become the de facto standard for testing React and other uh, libraries. And in fact, super excited um, that uh, Playwright has joined the party too. And, and Playwright's uh, new locator API uh, is inspired by Testing Library. So wherever you go, uh, you can have a pretty common API for testing stuff, which is sweet. So that is a little bit about me. Um, Cran, am I saying your name right? Um, is it uh, is it Cran? Yeah. Cool. Why don't you uh, we, introduce yourself? Yeah, Cran, that's fine. Um, cool, I will. So my name is Cran Hansen. I work for MongoDB on the RealmJS team, and I'm building a uh, database for uh, a cross-platform database. And I think my perspective on this discussion uh, will probably be also around like testing native modules. Uh, this is also what I'm going to be talking at, uh, sorry, talking about at the uh, conference and uh, the some of the hurdles that are involved with that, like especially that you're not able to um, basically emulate as much as you otherwise can when you're uh, testing an app, uh, if that makes sense. Yeah, I'm looking forward to the talk or to the discussion here. Sweet. Awesome. Next on my screen, I see John. Can you give us an intro to yourself, John? Yeah, sure thing. Uh, yeah, so my name is John. I work in Netflix uh, on the growth engineering side. Uh, so I work on a team that supports the UI developers who are building Netflix.com and a lot of the consumer facing you know, web applications. Um, and so my focus is a lot these days around kind of developer tooling and CICD. Uh, so testing is definitely one of those things I, uh, I'm interested in and uh, Love to hear everyone else's takes as well. Sweet, good stuff. And uh, let's see, as far as speakers go, the next person I see is Naya. What's up, Naya? Hi, um, it's Nia, sorry. So my name is oh, Nia. Oh, I'm sorry, um... thank, you for, thank you for correcting <laughs> me. I will, I will say it properly now. <laughs> no, no worries. A good way to remember is Nia means purpose. Um, yeah, uh, um, I'm... But based out of Toronto, um, I actually work for a company in New York called Healthy. Uh, we're a health um, admin and uh, integration platform, and we help, you know, doctors do their jobs kind of stuff. Um, my team basically focuses on the platform side of front end, and um, we um, help the feature teams, like, be able to do their jobs. So, so a lot of what I look at is 
um, in a legacy application? How do we start setting up tests in a way that developers can pick it up and you know, um, continue that pattern forward as the company grows and the product grows? And how do we um, handle legacy applications and their problems <laughs> that comes along with it um, while trying to move forward and integrate with uh, new tooling? Sweet. Sounds awesome. All right. Um, well, that's all the um, speakers that I'm seeing on here uh, from the... Uh, uh, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, we have Sean, I believe. Uh, yeah, but hey, I, Sean, I don't... Oh, sorry, Sean, go ahead. No worries. Um, my name is Sean Evening. Uh, I am based out of Hamilton, Ontario, just outside of Toronto, uh, for Neo there. Um, and I work as a developer experience engineer at Chromatic. Some of uh, the core contributors or a large amount of the uh, core contributors to Storybook uh, work at Chromatic there full time on Storybook. And so, yeah, we've been doing a lot of, a lot of work over the last year or so around uh, interaction testing your components uh, using the same APIs as React Testing Library uh, to be able to uh, test your components in a visual way. Love it. I just yes. have to uh, say, sorry, I just have to say, Sean, like the chromatic stuff is awesome. We've been like using a lot of that in, in and integrating it with like Jest and some of the React testing library stuff as well. And it has been phenomenal. Love it. That's so good to hear. Thank you. have each person answer one at a time or just like have people jump in it'll probably be awkward either way so we'll just um obviously i don't uh, moderate twitter spaces very much or at all ever uh, all right so what trends have you uh seen with testing react apps over the past year i'm gonna let somebody else take this first what did you i'm sorry i cut out a little bit what did you can you repeat the oh yeah i'll repeat the question um, and also, actually, I noticed um, that Britt Joyner is a listener in here. Britt, if you want to jump in um, and request to be a speaker, then the host can, can let you in. Uh, so the question is, what trends have you seen with testing React apps over the past year? There have been none. No, just kidding. Uh, oh, Crane, <laughs> did you have a question or something to say? No, not not really. Like I, so, uh, I think um, also as I said, maybe I'm uh, like my approach into testing is more uh, that of a library maintainer, um, to be honest. So you typically will like test lower level. Um, or your tests are typically lower level than product. Uh, yeah, maybe that's be. that's one, maybe one of the uh, the things that I want to get at at some point. But I, I don't know. So I think uh, I guess a lot of the like the UI oriented uh, integration tests, uh, instrument tests. Um, I think is uh, there's a lot of pace in that. Like there's a lot of development going on there. Uh, also, you mentioned like uh, UI pixel. Like the was it chromatic the uh, like a UI testing where you like mm. image diff or stuff like that. Um, I think it's that's very interesting trends. But uh, for me, I think we're lacking a lot in terms of um, like tools for integration tests for libraries. Um, but uh, so one one trend that I saw, I'm also very I'm embedded in the React Native community more than uh, Bear React. And I think one thing that we saw was that testing is more important because now we have the end-to-end -end test uh, app merged in the React Native repo where we used to have not that many like automated tests. Uh, so that's a great, it's something that's being invested mm -hmm. in. Maybe that's why the trend that I'm seeing. Mm, yeah, yeah. Um, I actually, one trend that I've seen in myself, and maybe uh, this is uh, something that you all can relate to, is that the um, it, it seems like uh, 
so I, I made the testing trophy several years ago as like a, a, you know, the testing pyramid is outdated and we need a different shape of our tests and stuff. And uh, where end to end test is, you know, sits on the top still like and everything. But one thing that I've noticed in myself is that my trophy is getting a little top heavy. So I, I am finding myself writing more end to end tests than I used to. And I think the reason is because I'm doing more full stack development than I used to do. Um, and that like those in that environment, it just makes a lot more sense to write more end to end tests. Has anybody else mm -hmm. experienced similar things? Yeah, actually, um, like we've at least, at least for me too, like I found unit tests that like look at pure functions have been helpful. And like, especially now with the integration with chromatic, a lot of our components like have diff tests or whatever coming through there. So like the only other really useful places have been the integration. So like the mm -hmm. pattern that's really like, especially as we're like handling a lot of legacy code and we're like moving forward from there, um, having integration tests that like make sure all of the user workflow works correctly um, with like an actual database behind it is um, much more useful for us. And then writing unit tests for like gut check that the function is actually returning the data, you know, that structure that we're expecting. Um, tied in with like storybook docs tend to be like the best way I've, I, or the more sustainable way I've seen um, for developer experience as well as like having coverage. Mm -hmm. yeah. is, is that the case for others? Like has um, the new stuff that's been coming out with docs and stuff helping shift our language around testing? Wow, was it just me? Ooh. Come on, guys. <laughs> I, I saw that Sean unmuted himself, so I was waiting for Sean to say something. Sorry, yeah, I just wanted to double check that no uh, no one else was unmuting themselves at the same time, and I was going to interrupt someone. Um, yeah, so uh, trends in testing has been an interesting one. Uh, before I was at Chromatic, I worked at uh, a product company in Canada called Wealthsimple. Uh, which is like a, an investment uh, app. So it's sort of akin to like Robin Hood, but just for Canada. Uh, and we used to run a whole separate repo worth of end-to-end -end tests. Um, and at the end of the day, it was so, the run was so long and clunky that we ended up having to take it out of CI and just sort of run it in uh, in a box every half an hour or so and uh, paying any team uh, who was responsible for a piece of the UI um, that broke as part of those uh, as part of like running those tests. Uh, just to give you an idea those that whole test suite would take about an hour to run on a box so um, blocking everyone's PRs for that for every single commit uh, would mean nothing to get merged in. Um, what they ended up doing was only writing end-to-end -end tests for things that were critical. All, all of the happy path stuff, making sure people can sign up for accounts, making sure people can uh, deposit money, uh, withdraw money, all those types of things. Uh, and then from your like uh, your unit test and component test standpoint. Um, I was actually talking to one of my old coworkers there who had the updated count for their tests was something like 5,000 stories and tens if not 100,000 different unit tests um, to try and, uh, oh, sorry, with, uh, a bunch of different uh, tools pulled in together all of the coverage. We found that uh, trying to strive for a very high, if not 100% coverage, just had people writing um, sort of dummy tests for components, sort of like um, just checking whether it actually rendered uh, without, uh, without breaking. Uh, which was mm -hmm. fairly useless. But having interaction testing in Storybook is really, really helps with that. Um, I always found testing my components before to be sort of not pointless, 
but sort of sort of clunky when you can't see what's going on you just see like uh this this output of um <laughs> of text to say it to show you how it rendered um and then you need to sort of look over that as a snapshot to see whether that was correct or not so being able to see it visually in uh in a ui uh, has definitely really helped evolve my testing from a component standpoint i also mm -hmm. one wonder like to your point sean about the whole um end-to-end uh, -end test like the integration test getting the box getting so big like because like that is something we're also very worried about right um especially um as we're like writing more of those uh, my thought there is like is that a problem with the thought of testing or the thought of how we set up infrastructure for that stuff right um and if that's a separate discussion <laughs> If I can jump in, I mean, what I, I kind of want to build on Sean's point, I, I feel like this is a common problem. I do see the trend of, you know, it is often easier to write these end-to-end uh, -end tests. It feels more natural because that's what a user does. But you can get this thing that grows and grows and eventually takes an hour, kind of as Sean said. And we've seen that before, mm -hmm. too. Um, and, and, yeah, I mean, there is sort of a separate discussion maybe around infrastructure and how you scale that. Uh, but it is something I think we all kind of need to be aware of. And it's sort of that, that trade-off mm -hmm. of, um, you know, maybe we need to find perhaps different ways to organize our code uh, so that we don't have to run the entire test suite for, you know, for a PR. You know, if, say, for example, if we have a mono repo and we divide our app into packages and then, you know, we can just run the tests for those packages for that slice of functionality. Because uh, I've felt this pain, you know, before and it's it's rough when your PR builds take an hour and you're already parallelizing it and, you know, it just, it's terrible. And, uh, and so, yeah, anything we can do to kind mm -hmm. of, um, you know, address the underlying causes of why our test suite is so big or why we have to run all these things um, and maybe find ways to make it more natural to write uh, lower level, you know, component or, or unit tests, that kind of thing. I would love to hear more about the packages st structure you're talking about there, John, as well. Oh, sure. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, so, I mean, when I've run into this in the past, you know, oftentimes the, the pain point was we would have a giant mono repo. So one, one that I worked on years ago was a Rails app and it just wasn't divided up in any real way where you could just run the test for this, you know, for the, the, the courses uh, functionality or, or whatever it is. Um, but so for example, if you're talking about like a JavaScript application, um, you know, you might have, and again, this depends on what frameworks you're using or using Next or Remix or something like that. But just taking the example of like, um, you know, you have certain bits of functionality, say you have like a products area and you have an admin area. You could organize it in such a way using something like Lerna or using something like Turbo Repo, where each of those is an actual package um, that gets bundled up. Now, again, this does sort of depend on how you deploy your application. Is it a single page app? That kind of thing. But by by organizing your code into different packages or workspaces, that then opens up a lot of possibilities because then you can say, uh, well, I, I've only changed this code and I'm going to use something like Turbo Repo or whatever to to run just the things that are relevant for, for my change. And so even though your application might have a whole lot of things, uh, when you run your CI build, the tools such as Turbo Repo can look at it and say, oh, well, this is the only package that's changed. Therefore, for the tests, I'm only going to run its tests and that kind of thing. At certain scales, developing systems like that becomes really important um, for sure. So that makes sense. Um, I, before we get too much further along, I noticed that uh, uh, Britt Joyner is now in here along with, uh, with uh, Chris Griffin. And so I'd love to give them a chance to introduce themselves too. Britt, why don't you go first? Hey, yes, sorry about that. I This is my first Twitter space and I had some technical uh, difficulties joining in here. Um, That's very yeah, common. I, <laughs> Yes, yes, that, that's what I hear. And um, yeah, and I'm honestly here with the interesting perspective of I'm a, basically a junior developer and have limited experience with testing. And um, I was really interested by, you know, what Sean was mentioning earlier with the whole, you know, it, it, I see it as clunky. And like for most of my life, I've kind of spent like w most of my developer life, I guess, I've spent knowing this is an important thing to do, but feeling Can like I'm telling a computer to do a thing. Can you hear me? I can hear you fine. 
Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Now. yeah. Okay. Okay. Sorry. Um, but yeah, so just in case I'm a little quiet, uh, that's, I'm, I'm here to learn and, uh, share that, that newbie sort of perspective, but, um, yeah, full time. Um, I'm working as a head of developer relations at Pixie Bricks. It's a low code browser automation tool. And, um, I'm more, I'm, I'm not as involved in testing in this role, obviously, as um, I have been in the past, but uh, we use something called Rainforest that I really like that kind of helped me, um, it, it kind of helped make testing a little bit more visual for me, kind of like like Sean was saying about being able to like actually see things you're doing and, and making those sort of, writing those tests in a way that you can actually like see what's being produced and what, what it's interacting with. So yeah, th thank you all for having me. And, and Ken, I'm like honored. Like I, this is, I'm so honored to be like on a panel with you. And this is like, the, I think the first time we've ever chatted, but I've, I've seen you from afar. I've been looking up to you for a long time. <laughs> oh, that's nice of you, Brad. Thank you. I, I appreciate that you're here. Thank you for coming. Yeah. Uh, Chris, uh, can you intro yourself? Uh, yeah, I'm Chris. I'm a senior front end uh, developer at Fairwinds. We do a lot of Kubernetes kind of stuff, uh, basically helping you optimize action items and permissions and things like that, packaging a bunch of open source tools together into a nice pretty dashboard. Um, as far as testing, uh, I mean, I can always be better at testing. I think we all can. Uh, I really do like the evolution of how the testing pyramid used to be the big thing. And now like the testing diamond is really where the focus kind of lies. And I don't know, I think it's a fun group to chat with this about. Awesome. Uh, all right. So the next question we've got on here that I think would be interesting to hear what people have to say um, is about AI. That's like, seems to be something that everybody's talking about. Um, and so the question is, what impact do you think AI related testing tools will have on your testing strategy? I'll just leave that to you all. Has anybody used AI in helping write tests? I know uh, uh, one of my coworkers has been really, really interested lately with like using GitHub Copilot and gave like a demonstration to us about how he's been basically getting GitHub Copilot to like write his test for him. And it's really nice when we've already got sort of unit tests defined and it's a similar sort of function. So that's kind of the limit of my experience with it. But when he was showing, it was basically just like, yeah, it, it was like the computer was writing itself. And I was like, okay, this could help me actually learn unit testing because even if it's not correct, it at least gives me something to kind of start with. And then I can kind of see, okay, well, this part isn't working. So then I can change this aspect. So that's kind of how I feel about AI in general is it's never like a hundred percent, but I love how it can get me from kind of that zero to one. So I have something to work with and then can kind of flesh out things from there. Yeah, I, I want to echo that for sure. Oh, sorry, go ahead. No worries. I, I think um, maybe I, I wanted to reflect a bit about like the reason why we are testing. Um, and there, of course, there are, like, that's multi, uh, there's multiple answers for that. But one thing that comes to mind is like if, you're, if you have your AI writing your code and you have your AI writing your tests, then maybe, uh, maybe that takes away a bit of uh, thoughtfulness in a way. Like you go on autopilot and then you build something and then uh, you're not sure if the thing you build actually is, is actually valuable or um, so maybe there's something about like the the act of writing a test is also something that forces you to think about like what you're building and in that regard maybe like having AI writing your test is maybe not the best idea uh, that's my like initial thought I don't know if anybody reflects with that I mean I, I definitely have seen with tools like Copilot, uh, you can get some interesting results at times. And so it's definitely the kind of thing where it is a tool and it's not going to do everything for you. And so you need to be aware that uh, it's, you know, it's, it's going to have some strange behaviors at times. And so it's maybe just kind of like a fancy autocomplete in that sense. Uh, but yeah, you do need to be thoughtful around how you use it and make sure you're really, uh, you know, using it in a way that makes sense for what you need for your test. I, I will say, though, I have been pretty happy with Copilot so far, whether it's been uh, in terms of, you know, generating uh, test code for me or if I'm writing like a GitHub action workflow, that sort of thing has been really nice. Um, one other thing I wanted to touch on uh, just on the AI topic that I've seen is uh, 
you know, when you think about visual testing, um, a, a pain point sometimes is that it's, it's uh, you know, it's doing a screenshot and if it doesn't match exactly, it fails. And at times, you know, there are things that can change that don't actually matter. Um, and so there are interesting tools that are, that are out there. You know, one that I think we're using internally in Netflix is the Apple Tools Eyes uh, that does, you know, kind of the visual uh, screenshot, you know, testing, but it can do some things where it's like, if this part of the screenshot is, re is not relevant, you know, with AI, it can kind of figure out the things that actually matter so that um, you're not getting these kind of flaky failures for something where it's like, oh, it's off by a pixel. That doesn't actually matter. That kind of thing. I had a, yeah, so, um, sorry, sorry, go ahead, whoever was talking. Yeah. Oh, okay, I'll, I'll just be brief. I think that um, I agree with John that like AI is a tool um, that uh, that you use and you evaluate the, the output. Um, one of the practices that I encourage people to do a lot with testing is just to make sure that your test can fail um, and that by, by changing the implementation, not by changing the test. Um, and so by doing that, you make sure that you're testing what you think you're testing because it's really easy to uh, have a test pass, but not actually uh, exercise the code that you're trying to test. And so if, if you are um, using AI to help you write your test, then uh, I think that's fine, provided that you ensure that the test can fail, because otherwise you can uh, wind up in a situation where the AI wrote a test that does pass, but uh, it doesn't actually test what you think it is. Hi, y'all. I'm a little late to joining Makes here, sense. but I, I did want to add something to that. Um, I wonder how AI will impact uh, test-driven development. I know not everyone does that as a process, but I find it uh, really useful for me to be able to build uh, features and know that I'm testing, you know, because you're doing that, making it fail, and then, you know, the red, green, red, green kind of process. Um, so I'm kind of curious about that as well. And also uh, just to add, like, I'm coming from a full stack uh, my team is Ruby on Rails back end, and we are React on the front end, but we are moving into the new space, kind of fashionably late to the party, moving things to Next.js in a separate application and getting on the graph, and that's changing a bunch of things. And one of the things that I wonder about, we rely a lot on our system tests, which are slow with our spec, but they catch a lot of different conditions, and we use Percy for our regression spec. So I appreciate it. I think, Kent, you were saying what you use with Apple to kind of do that same thing. Um, but I, I love what you said about the fact of those flaky pixel changes uh, to be able to like ignore some of that is also really valuable. So anyway. We're on the, um, hi Heather, we're uh, like my system or like this place I work at is also very similar actually. We are a monorepo with Rails and React on the front end, and we also use our spec with Capybara and stuff. Um, I, I thing with AI, like for us also, because we're in the health space, it has to be very carefully that we consider having Codepilot and AI other tools integrated because we deal with people's medical records and HIPAA compliance and all that fun stuff. Um, and agreed on all of the points, like I think it should be considered a tool of assistance. We shouldn't just blindly use AI to like write the code without double checking. All right, awesome. Let's move on to the next question here. We're already at halfway through our time. So, um, oh, I lost the questions. Here we go. Uh, so uh, we're kind of curious what things you have stopped doing uh, as far as testing is concerned, like what are things that you used to do and that you no longer do uh, as part of your testing process? Just snapshots or like regular snapshots. All of that is now just storybook for us, <laughs> like chromatic. Might be a little bit biased here uh, coming from a storybook team, but uh, same here. That being said, uh, I do love to use uh, inline snapshots when I'm writing uh, things like code mods or anything that builds like a pretty complex JSON structure, uh, just because um, you can get it right in line immediately. Um, 
and then just bounce it off of that. It's It's been really, really great for some of the auto config tools that I've been uh, writing. Is Is it okay to have an answer of like, not testing everything. I know maybe that's maybe that's a spicy take in in this talk, but um, I I've I when I've learned about how to kind of do like test driven development and stuff, we my the team I was on never really took a, a big approach to that, and sometimes it was kind of like testing was sort of after the fact and became a little bit of more of like a ritual, um, which sometimes you know it's still good to have there and make sure you've got coverage and and run tests on, on things like that. But I also kind of realized that testing for the sake of testing isn't necessarily always the right thing. And for reasons like that, sometimes, you know, I, I don't do testing every time I have like a hobby project or something like that. And I think it's more about making sure, you know, you're not just checking off boxes, but actually, you know, testing for your, your apps um, functionality and make sure it's like actually going to work and caring more about the things that matter rather than having hundred percent coverage. Absolutely. I, I think 100% coverage makes a lot of sense for libraries, but for applications, I, I think it was uh, who, who, I think it was Sean who said earlier that 100% uh, code coverage in products um, makes people write really useless tests and actually honestly um, harms the organization more than helps. Yeah, yeah. I, I probably was having technical problems when I missed that, but I completely agree with that. That's, that's awesome, Sean. I think um, yeah. one, one thing to add to that, like when you talk about like 100% coverage in a library, um, I think one of the ideas or the like the reasons behind that is that like you want to catch regressions. And especially if you like uh, you have this idea about you're building on some technology and if you at some day you want to change that underlying technology, maybe you can like run your integration, uh, sorry, your, your test suite, uh, maybe unit test like 100% coverage and then you can find all the bugs, right? But maybe the... There might be a truth in that uh, perhaps we are writing code that we throw away more nowadays. Uh, and this idea about the great refactoring that will come like five years down the road, maybe that never happens. And we just transition to something else like a new code base. Uh, so the value of these regression tests and uh, like 100% coverage might not be as large as it used to be, perhaps. That, that goes really well in line with the the idea for optimizing for change. And um, I, I think that's just really useful uh, mental model for uh, testing in general. It's just that like, as, as cool as test-driven development is, and, and for some people it helps them deliver the feature faster. Uh, I don't think that's the case for most people and certainly not for me. And so um, writing the tests after you're certain that like you want things to stay this way is really useful. And then making sure that they stay free of implementation detail uh, is another way to optimize for change. I love that. That's great. And I, I think like, this is just, you know, as we think about tests, we, we just need to look at them in terms of like, what is the cost of this test we're writing? You know, like we, we can think about like, oh, it's going to protect me from bugs or whatever else, but you know, there's the time it takes to write it. There's the time and cost of like running it all the time. And then if you change some functionality, then you got to change that test. And maybe kind of like Kent, you were saying, it's maybe you're too into the implementation details and now you're just changing tests all the time. And, or if it's flaky, right? And so back to Britt's point, it's like a lot of these things, you know, we, we kind of look, we need to look at it and see what are the trade-offs and maybe I don't need a test in this case. And if we optimize for that change, you know, we, we don't test, uh, with automation, but we just test it manually and, and call that good. I'm not saying don't write tests, but, you know, think about those trade-offs and, and what makes sense for your scenarios. I think that's also a question or like consideration to have with business to some extent as well. I think when we're in the weeds as developers, we forget like what is the core business um, feature, right? And having tests specifically for those versus what we as developers always consider important versus what is critical for the business, right? Um, and I think um, there's sometimes that disconnect happening where to, the business logic is different versus the developer logic may look the same, but it's not. Um, like we shouldn't pair those together kind of thing, right? So um, I think at least my thought here is that, um, this should be something we keep in mind as the business itself grows. 
Yeah, it's definitely useful to keep in mind that not every line of test code has equal value. And, uh, and, and that also uh, testing and delivering features um, require the same, um, the, the same cost, uh, which is your time. And so uh, it, you have to kind of do a return on investment calculation. Like, is it more important for me to, to fix this bug that users are experiencing? Or is it more important for me to write this test to make sure this other feature doesn't break? And uh, yeah, it, everybody's going to have a different answer to that question based on uh, the constraints that you're working under. I think it also, um, a thing to consider is just, you know, depending on your application and how many uh, experiments might be going on in, in flight at the same time, we have a lot of kind of uh, different, we end up having a lot of props that toggle different experiments within a same component. And so for us, you know, testing helps us kind of just ensure, even if it's a quick check of like, if this condition, if they're allocated to that experiment, they're going to see this versus this. Okay, good. And then we test it in prod. We do all our testing in prod. But um, yeah, I think it just kind of depends like how, how many people are in your code base doing things and how many things are in flight and how, you know, it's like, do no harm. Like you, you want to do is probably write your tests just as specifically as possible um, it, just to ensure that you have that uh, peace of mind and then and move forward. Sweet. So um, good stuff. Uh, another question here that I think is uh, um, you would be an interesting thing to discuss is observability and production monitoring and how that has impacted how people test. Um, I, I know that some people will test in production. They like literally run their test uh, in production and, and use feature flags to turn things on once uh, once things are testing well, um, which uh, I think at certain scales makes a ton of sense. And, um, and it is a, definitely a good way to have confidence in uh, your uh, the stuff that you're delivering. Um, and so, yeah, well, I, and I remember hearing years ago that uh, uh, Facebook, I think, will like slowly roll out features and um, will uh, roll those features back um, if they're seeing increased error rates or other key indicators that they have. Um, if any of those key indicators start going down, then they just roll things back and then evaluate what went wrong, um, which is pretty cool when you're operating at Facebook scale that you can um, just kind of throw something out there and uh, if things aren't looking good, then you just pull it back. Um, yeah, so I'm just curious, uh, other folks here, especially John, I know you're, you're working at a pretty big scale at Netflix. Um, how has observability and monitoring impacted the way that you all test your apps? Yeah, it's it's critical to how we work. I mean, so much of what we do, it's, you know, there's so many experiments that are happening, you know, say for the plan selection for signing up for Netflix, you know, somebody wants to kind of tweak that and and that's a whole experiment you know and that gets tried out on a small scale and then based on the results of that then it might be rolled out more broadly right but it is something that that comes with scale right and and many you know many of us i think are not working at that scale um but there are things that i think are common across any application right and so i think any any app you're working on it's important to get you know metrics and alerting set up so that if you have something like a sign-up process, you can know when it's when it's going wrong, right? And so you can be alerted. Um, and kind of getting back to that happy path uh, conversation around end-to-end -end testing, um, you know, there's this concept of having synthetic tests or smoke tests or whatever you want to call it. But the idea being you have a, an automated test that runs in production to make sure on a regular cadence that your core functionality is working. So then that way, independently of any code that's going out, or independent of uh, how much traffic you're getting at any moment, you'll know when this process breaks, right? Um, and so, you know, we, we use that at Netflix, we used it at Amazon, but at, at any company can do that. And I think that's super critical uh, to ensuring your, your app is working in the way that you expect it to. I'd love to just add to that because I'm at Stitch Fix and while we're not quite at the scale of Netflix, 
um, we are at a larger scale than we were when I started six years ago. Um, and one of the steps on any experiment when we deploy is creating a dashboard in Datadog and tracking metrics for page views and, and um, interaction. And if anything looks weird or we start to see bug snag, or, you know, then we roll back and fix. And so it's very much an active testing and prod, um, you know, monitoring. And I think it's, it's crucial. It's so important to have that tooling in place. I think, yeah, uh, the, the challenge with um, the like scaled approach is that you kind of acknowledge the fact that some of our users are going to experience something uh, a less than optimal experience very possibly. Like, of course, I, I'm sure that uh, uh, even at that scale, you're probably running <laughs> tests before deploying stuff, um, or I hope, hope you do. But um, it, with uh, when, when you're at that scale, having that um, monitoring in place uh, is a lot more uh, useful. You just get a lot more um, signal um, when you deploy something new. Like in, in some cases, it's very instant, like, oh man, this is really bad. Uh, whereas if you're working at a smaller scale, you've got a hundred uh, people who are using your app. It, it takes a while to get that sort of signal. So it becomes uh, even more critical that you uh, wait to deploy until you're more certain uh, of things. I, it, yeah, I guess it's a little more nuanced topic than that, but um, great. Well, we've got another question here about uh, the uh, just like general excitement around uh, new things. So what are your, what are the things that you're most excited about with new testing tools and uh, testing features, practices, patterns? Um, I don't know. I want to plug my talk. <laughs> the uh, the uh, it's a tool that I'm building, Mocha Remote, basically running um, tests on device on other devices than your host device executing the tests. Um, yeah, I think this idea about uh, running tests somewhere and having the um, the output in your terminal on your local machine just is a great user experience when you're building something that's not uh, simply uh, a website. I think like using AI, I know we've kind of already talked about it, but just seeing AI and, and using it to write test assertions for visual testing and for automatically repairing the test. And so we already kind of talked about how, you know, if you're starting from scratch, it can get you there. Hi, but I'm so sorry to interrupt, but Britt, I think when you're speaking, like I can't hear it at all. Oh, that's so weird. Um, I don't know what to do differently. <laughs> I can hear. Yeah, can you're hear coming you, through, okay. Yeah, okay. Um, yeah, basically just saying that um, using AI to like write test assertions and um, automatically repair the test Uh, plus one on the AI, and then also, um, it just it's nice to see within the JavaScript ecosystem, in in particular, how testing frameworks just keep getting better, right? And so, you know, when I look at things like Playwright or React Testing Library, you can write things in a very natural way, and you don't have to do, you know, like oh, you know, wait for this element to appear and all these things. It's just it's getting better and better to to write tests and and to write them in a way that's not going to be flaky. So as as someone who authors tests from time to time, that's uh, that's really nice for me. I'd love to hear if anybody here has uh, had experience with the V-test as well. Is it like a, is it a different tool for testing? Yeah, I am loving V-test. I started switching over some of uh, our storybook repos to use V and and V test, uh, and it's pretty dang fa fast, I will say. On the sort of flip side uh, of the trend uh, of all these new testing tools, I guess I'm I'm a little wary of all the different test runners that are coming out, um, just purely for 
for the sake of like needing to re relearn things or people, you know, picking uh, one repo, picking up Jest, and then you've got VTest and maybe you now want to run your tests with bun or uh, I, I mean, we've even got storybook running, running tests now, which uh, I think is awesome. But yeah, I think the more runners we end up with the, the harder it's going to be for ourselves in the long run. <laughs> Not yeah, to also, say that we shouldn't innovate on the, on it though. Yeah. Also Node.js shipping uh, testing primitives. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's true. Like you, you want to have a community that's available to like um, develop new things, innovate, but uh, definitely there's also a price to that in terms of the community, you not converging like this divergent. Uh, is, uh, it has a cost as well. Definitely. Yeah. I, I've uh, played around with each one of those as well. And I, I agree, Chris, it is kind of, uh, it is a challenge. Um, it, um, there are definitely problems that they're trying to solve. I, I think VTest is solving some of the ESM compatibilities uh, of Jest, and, and I think primarily it was uh, they want to make sure that the the build um, and the test are running with the same config. And so that, I, I think that was the primary motivation. So like the motivations are good. Uh, like Bun wants to have their uh, test runner that's like super fast and optimized and and Node wants to make it so people don't have to install stuff. Like, uh, you know, they, they want to make it a little easier to get things going. So like the motivations I think are good, um, but uh, it, does, um, it, it does kind of fragment the uh, community a little bit. Um, but I, I also am super into VTest and, and with Remix supporting Vt now, um, I'm even more excited about VTest and, and the possibility of just making it so that my build and my tests are running uh, under the same configuration, uh, which I think is actually really uh, a important uh, practice. Awesome, fix. Okay, well, we're coming down toward the end of our time. Uh, we do still have a little bit more time, but I did notice um, there are a couple of people who have been commenting on the space on Twitter. I, I barely understand how any of this stuff works. Um, and also, I even called it the wrong name, but I don't care. Uh, so the uh, one question that I think is, um, is use or uh, would be interesting for us to talk about is a little bit uh, around um, testing coverage and where you think a, a good minimum testing uh, coverage would be. So we, we talked about it a little bit where 100% code coverage in a product uh, results in really uh, bad tests, um, but uh, it can be really useful for a library. Uh, but where is that number for, uh, for folks uh, when it comes to application tests? If it's not 100, then what is it? I would say it's a hundred percent of all the code that makes money for your company. Hundred percent agreed on that. Maybe uh, there's something to be said about like the um, like the code coverage should maybe be a function of how much the code is being used by other code in a way. Like so, it has the because if it's like a leaf part of your app, it's like a single component that's only used on one screen, then maybe it's not as critical as if it's like business logic that's imported uh, all over the place. I'd also say uh, most times, like we forget like tables and forms have a lot of business logic. Um, even if you don't test everything, I think just the basics of like checking those, the form logic works probably. <laughs> Uh, and making sure that like all your forms of some nature with like uh, that's like critical to the business having tests makes makes a lot more sense. Yeah, I, so I've um, got a blog post about uh, how to know what to test is what it's called, and I in that I talk about the importance of use case coverage. Uh, being more important than code coverage because when you're thinking about use case coverage, it just becomes a lot more clear. Uh, what the priorities are. Uh, getting back to John's comments and like, it should be what your business makes money on. Um, and so like the problem with code coverage is like every line of code is equal in that measurement. 
but in use case coverage, the use cases are much more clear that they're not equal. And so the priority becomes a lot more clear. And, uh, and then actually when you're thinking about use cases, even the tests themselves will change. Like the title of the test, it will be uh, less of, um, you know, like performs this specific calculation and more of handles this, this situation. Um, that, that was a really bad example, but hopefully that, that comes across. It's like thinking about use cases will kind of help you drive the, uh, your focus there. And I, I think it's kind of interesting too that we haven't actually given a specific number other than I suppose 100% of the code that makes you money. Um, but uh, uh, that also probably is like an impossible metric to really derive. And so the, the, I think the point is that there is no number. Um, you can't really know uh, for sure what the best uh, code coverage is. And, and it's going to vary widely on your industry too. Like if you're doing self-driving cars or, or uh, autopilot on an airplane or, or some medical device, um, I hope you have pretty dang good co uh, code coverage and maybe even 100% is appropriate in those uh, situations. Um, but if you're a startup and you're just trying to get your product off the ground, um, I'd say you probably don't need any, like m many tests at all. Like uh, even a single test that says, yep, the app runs uh, is probably sufficient for a scenario like that. So I, I just don't think there's a number for this. And I think I'd jump in and say that the moment you create a number, you're going to create people gaming that number just to make sure that they hit it. And that's where you end up getting really brittle and hard to maintain tests. Yeah, we're getting 100% from everybody here on that one. <laughs> uh, <laughs> awesome. Uh, okay, well, um, I've got to jump off here in about five minutes. Does anybody else have something they wanted to talk about that they didn't? Uh, and by the way, I have to leave, but I don't like, they just threw me in as the moderator last minute. So if y'all want to stay, that's fine with me. <laughs> but uh, yeah, was there anything that uh, anybody wanted to discuss that we didn't get to yet? Yeah, actually, if we are run out, uh, run out, sorry, run out of questions, uh, especially we are also close to the to the uh, end of the end of the meeting, we can wrap up. So, uh, if there is anything else to to add or discuss, uh, I wanted to say that it was a pleasure to host you today and uh, listen to this uh, great conversation. See you in New York. <laughs> yeah, Cheers. absolutely. Oui. Thanks, everyone. Bye, Thank everyone. You. Thanks. Bye-bye. Have a good rest of the day. Bye-bye.